This webinar series is the first of a four-part series. It's based on a Stanford webinar course that's actually taught by Mata and Ethan. Um, and the course will go through topics like organic, um, paid acquisition, virality, activation, retention, and, me and measurement. And today's topic will be taking you through organic strategies. Um, and so before we do that, I'll just go through some housekeeping items really quickly. So the audience is muted, um, but you'll be able to ask questions in the Q&A bar or the chat throughout the duration of the webinar. Um, the webinar is also being recorded, so you will receive these recordings and slides um, tomorrow morning. And we'll also have live polling throughout the webinar. So please participate. Um, the questions are really interesting. So with that, I'll hand it over to Mata. Thanks, Johanna. Super excited to be here today um, and to talk about growth. Just a little bit about me. I'm uh, from Romania. I'm a nerd. I'm obsessed with mobile and I do play a lot of mobile games. Um, and uh, what else? I started a grow mobile app called Kindred before Branch with the same co-founders for about a year and a half. So I experimented a lot and learned a lot about growth doing that and then working with a lot of customers for Branch. And now I um, lead marketing uh, for Branch and I also do a podcast called How I Grew This where I interview people about growth. And then Ethan, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, so I'm Ethan. I am uh, from Los Angeles, but I'm living here in San Francisco now. Um, I uh, work at a company called Graphite, which is an organic growth company. So a lot of what we do is focus on content strategy and uh, search engine optimization. And um, I wear the same same colored clothing every day and I like to eat salt. How are you, Kevin? And then for our guest today, we have Kevin, who's gonna help us, um, who's a guest for our course and who is going to present and teach part of the webinar today. Kevin, please introduce yourself. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on, Maran Ethan. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, and to you as well, Johanna. Uh, and thanks for everybody else for tuning in. Um, I am currently the vice president of SEO and content at a company called G2. We are a marketplace for B2B software. We're basically disrupting the whole software buying process. We're going up against Gartner as the big incumbent. Um, and I've been with G2 for um, almost two years by now. Um, as you can hear from my accent, I was originally born and raised in Germany, came over to the US um, about six years ago. In my free time, um, I'm a power lifter, so I uh, lift some, some weights to balance out the desk work. Uh, and fun fact is that I often like the villains more than the heroes. So a big fan of uh, Darth Vader, Thanos, that kind of stuff. Um, on a serious note, I've, I've been in this for about 10 years now, maybe a little over than uh, over 10 years. Uh, and uh, I had the honor to, to grow organic traffic um, and revenue at companies like Atlassian, Dailymotion, been consulting tons of companies like uh, Pinterest, eBay, uh, Eventbrite, and a couple of others. Uh, I'm really excited to present some of the concept, concepts that I've learned and applied over the last couple of years to you in this course. Awesome, great having you Kevin. So because this is a part, a serious part, we thought that we would actually start with kind of talking about what growth is and I'll let Ethan cover this. Sure, so um, growth has uh, come to be over the last 10 years or so, so it's still pretty new and being defined and figuring out its, its uh, most appropriate role in the organization. And so traditionally growth sat under marketing and, and brand marketing. And then Facebook in the late 2000s created a growth team because they saw a growth stalling. And then that team essentially created a much more data-driven, precise uh, approach. One of the things that they talked a lot about is growth accounting. So being very data-driven and met metrics-oriented with, with your marketing, which of course lends itself to digital more so than uh, offline brand marketing. And so over the last 10 years or so, more and more uh, growth teams have come, come to be. More people have become aware of growth. It's growing up a bit. It's finding its uh, best location in the organization. And um, it is maturing. And then if we go to the next slide, uh, one of the key questions then again is where does it actually sit underneath? And, and it's not just marketing, it's not just product. Uh, it's a combination of a variety of different things. And so what I've seen and what a lot of other growth people have seen is that the most effective growth teams have dedicated resources and a full stack of uh, engineer product design and, and, and marketing so that they can build and own their own uh, their own uh, functionality. <clears throat> so growth is sort of this multidisciplinary area, but um, more and more it's finding itself living underneath uh, the product org. 
uh, and, and seeing the most success there. I think for this webinar series, we are going to cover concepts at the very basic level, and then we're going to pick a few and go really deep. So it's going to be a mixture of having, you know, going like broad and wide and then going very deep on a few topics. Uh, probably not on it. It's hard to go into, into depth into everything, uh, but some of the things we're going to go into depth today uh, are SEO uh, and organic. So with that, the other thing that's interesting is there's a lot of growth frameworks out there. Uh, this is the one that we, we used when we built our mobile growth handbook. Um, and I think the way we think about growth is really around um, you know, acquiring, retaining users, engaging them, and then advocating, and then attributing across and optimizing across all of them and doing all of that cross platform across multiple channels, web, app, uh, and more. Uh, the other, the interesting thing is when we look at how growth changed during COVID and we talk to a lot of people and we ask people, you know, like what is the most important thing? How does growth start today? We saw a big change. It used to start, everything used to kind of start with acquisition and retention was just part of the growth um, framework. And what we've seen as a big change is that actually retention has now become the most important part of growth during COVID. We saw people uh, and companies who uh, saw huge spikes in growth, who are now focusing on retention because they're scared of as COVID uh, gets better, that they lose those users. And then we saw people who are like deeply impacted and it's very hard to acquire new users, who then went back to focusing on retentions of their current users. So for all companies, whether they were impacted positively, negatively, or maybe not that impacted at all, the retention became very top of mind uh, during COVID, and we'll have an actual uh, section that will be just focused on retention. And this is kind of like, if we think about how uh, COVID disrupted how apps acquire new users, uh, we see uh, uh, we see something here. We saw that social media has grown, um, and, and we saw that during the the, the, the the top of the pandemic, we saw some really big changes that then tapered off um, to go back more to normal. Uh, and, and, and you know, when we think about organic acquisition, uh, we see that actually organic acquisition through our numbers and through looking at people uh, in different apps, depending on where they actually come from, organic acquisition is actually a lot more effective at driving purchases that paid acquisition channels. And the numbers are actually 4, 4, 4, 4 x more effective. Um, and we have a poll that we're going to join. We'd love to hear if you're a participant, how much of your, how much are you focusing on organic during this time? And with that, I am going to stop sharing and let um, and let Kevin uh, start doing a deep dive in front of the start the growth topics. Thank you. Do you want me to wait until the uh, vote is finished or is it gonna um, run until the end of the session? I think we'll stop it by the end of the session. We don't need to wait for the poll to finish. Yeah. Okay, cool. No worries then you should be, can you please confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Uh, it's it's the, the classic question to ask, but in fact, I did present once without people being able to see my screen. So now I'm gonna ask it every time. Um, so welcome to my session of this um, course. I wanted to zoom in on one really important concept that I think is a bit underserved in the growth or marketing world, which is the difference between content marketing and something that I call organic growth. And I'm gonna define this for you, but I wanted to give you a tangible example. So compare these two graphs left and right and really pay attention to the difference in patterns that you can see. So what this is, is a so-called crawl of a website. So similar to search engines, I send a bot to these two different websites. Left is one website, right is one website. And I looked at how their pages are interconnected, basically what their structure and what their architecture looks like. And without even understanding what exactly that is, you can already see that there is a, a big, big difference between those two structures. Right on the left side, you see many little islands that are surrounded by smaller islands. 
And on the right side, you see that these points are more clustered around the nucleus or around the core. And what that basically means is the, the, the biggest island that you see on the left side is the homepage of the website. And then you see little categories, which are the, the um, these islands. And then you see the smaller islands, which are little um, basically accumulations of product pages. And then on the right side, you see much more clustering. So once again, you find the homepage somewhat in the middle, but then you find a lot um, of closer uh, data points. And these are all little articles. And so as you can guess, there is a fundamental structural difference between those two different sites. Um, they are um, Amazon and Atlassian. And the point that I want to make here is that there are different business models, right? Amazon is, you could say a marketplace. It's, it's many things at this point, but the core business is Amazon's marketplace. And Atlassian is a SaaS business, a software business. And their organic or their growth strategies are fundamentally different based on their business model and based on their site structure, right? And that has, of course, very, very big implications for your strategy as well, right? And this is, this is the, the key point that I want to make here because um, a lot of growth experts and marketers um, uh, don't differentiate between these two different approaches enough. I, I, I call them, uh, so we, we're, go, we're going to come back to the difference between content marketing and organic growth in a second. But um, when we talk about these site structures, I differentiate between centralized structures and decentralized structures. So centralized structure, to go back to this slide real quick, would be the structure of Atlassian. A decentralized structure would be the one of Amazon, right? And as you can already guess, um, the point is that with a centralized structure like the one of Atlassian, um, everything is much closer at the nucleus, right? Like you have a lot more content um, and the, the site growth grows in a much more organic way. Whereas the decentralized structure is much more, um, has a much more rigid structure. You know, you have your categories and under categories you have products. I call them instances here on this slide because you can translate that model to other businesses as well, not just marketplaces. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, but in a nutshell, what you have to take away and keep in mind is that um, centralized sites, they have a much more organic growth, decentralized sites, they have a much more structured approach to growth, right? And that has many implications. So when we talk about content marketing and organic growth, right? The content marketing approach um, is, is tied much more to centralized sites where the organic growth approach is tied much more to decentralized sites. And there are fundamental differences in the businesses that reflects in the growth strategy. So on the content marketing side, most of the content, most of the assets are self-created by the company itself, right? They mostly live on the blog or landing pages um, and the content mostly revolves around thought leadership. Um, there is some generic content as well. When I, when I say generic content, it's really the, the much more, um, I want to say, search engine optimized content that is clearly um, structured around a topic or a keyword. And the biggest challenges are really creating and promoting and distributing that content. Examples of companies that follow that approach are, as I mentioned, Atlassian, but also Zapier, HubSpot, Salesforce, a lot of B2B companies, right? But there is also the consumer side which mostly consists of direct to consumer companies. And we're gonna, we're gonna dive a bit deeper into those companies and what, what, uh, uh, what other examples there are. And then on the organic growth side, this is where we deal much more with scalable systems. And the difference is that those companies, their content is often created by users. This is the case for user generated content or by an inventory that they sell like products on Amazon, if you will. Um, their scope is usually much more um, tied to product category pages or tag pages. Um, and their challenges are really the technical optimization, building network effects, flywheels, and, and improving the user experience. Not to say that user experience is not, it's not important for, for companies that grow by content marketing, but uh, in organic growth, it, it has a much, much more uh, it has much more, uh, much higher impact on the growth itself. And then examples here are uh, Pinterest, Spotify, Netflix, social networks, marketplaces, um, all this kind of stuff. And so the core question 
to ask yourself before developing a growth strategy is really to understand what business you're in. Um, if you haven't heard the name Peter Drucker, uh, that's a gap I strongly recommend you to fill. He wrote some of the best management and leadership books out there. So uh, strongly recommend you to, to catch up on that. But um, again, this key question is timeless and also applies to growth. Now, coming back to the different types of companies and the different approaches, on this graph or on this uh, chart, I mapped um, B2C and B2B companies against um, the different business models, like a marketplace or a consumer created, uh, sorry, company created content, right? It's basically that you have con uh, content marketing on the lower uh, Y axis and um, uh, organic growth on the upper Y axis. And when we map it against it, there are a couple of interesting patterns that we see. First of all, there, are B2B companies that can follow a marketplace model? And that is a bit counterintuitive because we talked about how B2B companies often grow primarily on content marketing, but there are growth models as well. And one example is uh, G2 because we have a listing of different software categories and reviews as well. That is a scalable inventory that allows us to apply uh, organic growth methodology to to grow our business. Another example would be Trello. Trello has public instances and boards, which would allow them uh, to build network effects. And then Shopify is another example. Shopify doesn't just have the core site where you sign up for the software, but also, um, for example, a, um, a section where you can buy different themes or where you can get images for your, for your marketplace, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then on the B2C side, we have companies like uh, Yelp or Facebook, which also have an inventory for in the, uh, in the in the case of Yelp, it's of course restaurants or local businesses. In the case of Facebook, it is pages, profiles, and a couple of other taxonomies. Um, and they can use that to scale their efforts and to apply organic growth methodology. But then also on the B2C side, you have some companies that grow on content marketing, like the classic direct to consumer companies that are sprouting everywhere right now. And then we already mentioned the B2B side, a couple more examples besides Atlassian that grow on content marketing are um, Adobe, MailChimp, HubSpot, um, and many others. And I wanted to, um, add a bit more insight into what it actually means to grow on content marketing or organic growth. So I mentioned before that organic growth is very driven by technical optimization of your site or app. And classic challenges that we see here are uh, indexing and crawling of all of your pages. Right? When we think about a company like Facebook, they have millions of different profiles and businesses that, that live on their app. And so as a growth expert at Facebook, you deal a lot with the challenge of making all of these millions of profiles and businesses accessible to search engines and therefore to users, right? You're also concerned about the content quality. So how many empty or abandoned profiles live on your platform? You wanna make sure that you find some way to link between the different businesses or uh, profiles um, so that search engines and users can discover them, right? You're also concerned with speed and of course, uh, uh, things like internationalization. And then on the content uh, marketing side, you're much more um, concerned about the production and creation of content, promotion, distribution, getting uh, PR to work, and then internationalization is one pattern that stretches across um, both methodologies, content marketing and organic growth. And so I wanna leave you with a couple of core questions to ask yourselves, um, totally acknowledging that this, these are two huge concepts that take a lot of time to delve into and we only have a couple of minutes here. But if I had to boil it down to some of the key questions you have to ask yourself when it comes to organic growth, it's really what scalable inventory you have that you could expose to search engines or to users um, and that it could be things like products, categories, users, information, um, instances. It really depends on the app that you're working on. And then a second key question could be, could a freemium model work with this? Another pattern that you find when you look at, at, at um, companies that grow on organic growth principles is that they often use a freemium model um, to acquire users because it's very well suited 
to an inventory that you can expose publicly. And then lastly, um, another question you want to ask yourself is how you get backlinks from users or customers. Um, a lot of big um, platforms, especially social networks, don't have to deal with it as much, but there are other cases, for example, DoorDash, um, that really had to think about to, uh, getting, getting backlinks to appear higher in organic search. And then on the content marketing side, um, you take a completely different approach, right? You think much more closely about the core problems of your audience that you can then reflect and cover in your content. You also want to think about uh, getting a PR bus, you know, like what is some data that you can write about uh, or some interesting stories you can tell that would get coverage in the media. And then lastly, how can you build and maintain and scale a pipeline of content creation, right? That's where you really have to think about who creates content, how much content do you have to create, um, and how can you uh, manage that over time? So I hope that was useful to you. Um, I want to uh, hand it over to um, Ethan from here, um, and thank you for your attention for my section of the session. Thank you, Kevin. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, I want to piggyback off of uh, everything that you talked about, Kevin. So um, you, you talked about a couple of things. One is what assets do you have that you can use to be competitive and, and to create useful content that can rank? And then the second is um, what do your users actually want? And I would add also which keywords and topics do you want to rank for? And what is the appropriate web page and content and, and design experience for those pages? And so uh, the, the way that I think about it is that ultimately Google is optimizing for the user's intent. And this is a significant change over the last five years where uh, in the early days, Google had a rule-based algorithm. And so a lot of what an SEO's job was, was to uh, figure out where the holes were and to try to trick the algorithm. And as the algorithm gets more and more complex and there's more artificial intelligence algorithms, uh, as part of that, those are optimizing for some sort of human behavior, like uh, clicking, staying, reading, buying a product, uh, fulfilling their intent, uh, ultimately. And so I, I see the SEO's job over time transitioning from finding holes in the algorithm to trying to understand how Google's fulfilling for the intent and trying to, trying to do the same thing. And so I think uh, once you've taken stock of the content and functionality that you have that you can offer users, the next question is, what do we want to rank for? And what is their appropriate page and strategy to rank for those topics? So um, one way to think about it, uh, I, I highlighted here a few of the inputs. So things that, that affect ranking are things like, uh, what is your authority? But also, is the user experience the right user experience to fulfill the intent? Um, very importantly, is the content the right content to fulfill the intent? And did you get good engagement and good, good conversion? And so most sites, one of the hardest things to grow on is authority. And so if you don't have a lot of authority, then you uh, might have a, a, a very uh, challenging time growing, you might produce a lot of content, doesn't rank, doesn't get results, and, you, and then you wonder why uh, that happened. And even if you don't have all the authority, um, you can still win on things like having better content, a better user experience, and, and better engagement, even if you don't have the highest authority. And when Google is ranking pages, they're not ranking... <clears throat> Uh, with absolute numbers, they're ranking you against the best alternatives. And so you don't always need to compare yourself with an Amazon or a Facebook or a Wikipedia. You compare yourself with the other results that are ranking. And so how are they scoring on some of these dimensions and how can I beat them on those dimensions? And one of the things that I see uh, as the biggest opportunity to win on is content. Uh, much of the content online isn't that great. Uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunity to have better content and, and to uh, beat your competitors by figuring out where they have gaps and holes in their content and, and winning there rather than exclusively trying to get backlinks. So again, you know, you, you've taken stock of, of the content assets that you have, of the uh, value that you have for you, the users. Next, you then want to say, what is it that I want to rank for? And uh, what is the intent of each of those clusters? So a common... Uh, paradigm for a shopping site or a marketplace site uh, selling uh, products or selling shoes or things like that would be um, these intents of learn, browse, and buy. And so uh, buy and browse are similar to what Kevin was talking about with organic growth, where they're programmatically generated pages. They're essentially a list of things or pages for specific items like a specific product or a specific restaurant. So that's on the organic side. 
But more and more what we're seeing is that Google is ranking uh, article content marketing type content. And the reason why is because the intent is that I don't just want to look at a long list of things. I want to read something or learn something or, or uh, get some sort of long form article. And so more and more we're seeing uh, the pages that are ranking are these content marketing type pages where the, the, the intent is to learn. So something like how do I do this? What is guide to uh, things like that? And we're focused not on keywords. We're focused on topics. And so in the early days of SEO, you would want one page for every single keyword. But more and more, Google is grouping semantically similar keywords into topics. So something like best LCD TVs, LCD TV re reviews, new LCD TVs. These are all essentially a user saying, I want to buy a, a, an LCD TV. I want to know which ones are good. I want to know what to what I need to consider about the TV. This is all one topic. So we should have a single page for this one topic. And then this rolls up into what is the intent of the user uh, looking for LCD TVs? It's probably to, to browse a set of items, or maybe it's to learn something. And so we start with the individual keywords that we want to group to the topic level. And each topic is essentially a page, an article, or a list page, or a product page. And then we up level to what is the intent. And uh, one way to, to actually answer the question. So we might think that we have uh, a ton of really great UGC, but maybe users just don't want the UGC. Uh, a common example is maybe we have a ton of comments, but is that actually what we, for the queries that we want to rank for, it, is that what the user wants is many, many comments or do they want an article or, or do they want a list? So you can actually start inferring that by looking to looking at the keywords that you want to rank for and trying to infer patterns. So if you see that most of the articles for something like eyeliner liquid, which to me sounds like I want to buy something, uh, in reality, it's actually many articles. And so Google is telling us the intent is not just to buy or to browse a list of items. It's actually to read something or to learn something or, or to, to, to get a guide to something. And so we can think beyond just what our intuition is about what the intent of the keyword is. And we can actually just get the answer. And, and we can do that by looking at many examples, looking in Google and trying to infer patterns of what is the page type? What is on the page? Is it a listicle? Does it have filtering functionality? Does it have a map? These are all indications about what is the right page type and user experience for that uh, for that particular topic. And then uh, comes the content, which which Kevin talked uh, a lot about. And so we're seeing some pretty uh, significant changes in content. So one is again, shift more towards articles rather than browse type pages. Um, but there's also specific uh, nuances to this. So we see a lot more long form articles that are a thousand words or longer. And we actually see uh, surprisingly users reading uh, for, for a lot of the screen recording that I've seen, reading the entire article, going all the way to the bottom. Um, many people would think that users are quickly looking at a page and then leaving, but actually for many of these long form articles, users are reading the pages and, and getting a lot of value out of them. Um, the second thing is then how do you actually make that content engaging and easy to navigate? And so uh, Google recently published something about how, how they're using AI. One of the ways that they're doing that is they're looking at things like subtopics. So not just the keyword level, but what are concepts that are talked about. So for eyeliner liquid, you know, a step-by-step -step tutorial or maybe different types of eyeliner or different types of pens or different types of colors. Um, not just keywords, but the concepts, talking about those concepts. Um, the other is, uh, is media. And so we can also see patterns in media. So certain queries should and shouldn't deserve media. So something like how to apply liquid eyeliner should definitely have step-by-step -step photos, whereas something like what is GDP maybe doesn't need a photo. And so depending on the query, you can again draw inferences uh, based on the results that are ranking about whether or not we need one photo, many photos, no photo, a video. Um, these are all indications about how we can optimize the content and again, fulfill the intent more. So we can use a data-driven approach for this, and there's no specific right answer, um, but we can use signals. And so if we're writing an article about eyeliner liquid, we may not know all the questions that a user has. So maybe we're, an, ideally we're an expert, and we know a lot about this, but we don't necessarily know all of the more basic questions that, that a user has, like uh, which ones are waterproof, or getting at a drugstore versus online or versus somewhere else, or a tutorial, or getting a list of the best items. And so all of these indications from things like autocomplete or people also ask or um, 
tools like ClearScope. These are all giving us indications about what is a comprehensive uh, piece of content because ultimately Google wants one page to answer all of the user's questions for all of those keywords that I mentioned. So for LCD TVs, one page answers uh, is a single answer for all of those. And in order to do that, we need to have a comprehensive set of these subtopics uh, of, of media covering everything so that the user doesn't need to go visit 10 different links to get the answer that they want. Um, which then also brings us to engagement. And so engagement, I'm seeing more and more as a strong signal for what ranks. Um, a lot of times what, what gets you to rank for page one is authority, but what gets you to rank between position one and three and two, a lot of times is better engagement, which means you clicked on the result, you stayed, you read, you got the answer that you wanted, you bought a product, you were able to browse. Uh, if you can have dramatically higher engagement, uh, then that can be a big win. Um, one interesting thing on content marketing in particular is that uh, the bounce rate and, and engagement rates on content is actually fairly low, relatively speaking. And the reason why is because uh, you can read a lot of text, but you don't need to click on anything for an article. Whereas with a browse page or a product page, there's lots of stuff to click on. And so uh, the more that we can take long form article content that answers the questions and then make it interactive and give engaging interactive elements on the page, then that's a, a really effective way to increase your engagement relative to all the other articles. Uh, and then again, you know, ultimately Google's goal is the algorithm is trying to predict, is your page the one that's going to get the user to convert? Are they going to fulfill their intent? Are they going to learn the thing that they want to learn? Are they going to be able to browse a set of the best uh, TVs or the best uh, eyeliner uh, options? Are they able to buy the thing that they wanted to buy? And the more that the page does that, the higher the engagement score will be and the higher you'll be able to rank. Um, so Kevin touched a bit on authority and uh, authority as well is something uh, it, it's very important. It's probably the hardest thing and the slowest thing to build because it takes time. Um, it's also broadened. And so authority is not just backlinks. It's many other inputs. And even if you don't have a ton of backlinks, you might be able to win on some of these other inputs. So if your company, for example, buys a ton of ads, that's a great way to build authority because Google cares about traffic that came from channels other than SEO. Uh, if, if you do a TV ad and a bunch of users are typing your brand into Google, uh, which is called branded search, that is kind of like a backlink and you'll, you'll start uh, climbing the ranks that way. If you get more social traffic, um, if your app is heavily used, all of these are inputs to authority and some of these are faster than backlinks. And so uh, I, I think it's good to, to think in terms of a portfolio of authority. Um, the second point to this is that there's topical authority. And so uh, back uh, with, with backlinks, um, a lot of times the backlink is optimized for the anchor text. So if you want to rank for chicken recipe, you want a link that says chicken recipe pointing to you. And uh, Google has gotten smarter about this for some of the other keywords. So, uh, so a couple things. One is that um, the branded search traffic can contain the same topical authority or the non-SEO traffic. If you get a ton of traffic, uh, one of the projects we worked on, we got a ton of traffic to uh, a viral uh, Jello shots post, which got like 2 million likes on Facebook. All of a sudden, the entire domain started ranking for all liquor terms, not just Jello shots, which brings us to the second thing, which is that the authority is semantically related. And so it's not just a, a simple string match of Jello shot. It's all liquor items, which Jello shot belongs to this broader tree of, uh, of Jello shots, just like chicken recipe applies to a broader set of, of food terms. And so even if your site doesn't have a ton of authority overall, uh, you probably have a niche uh, amount of topical authority. And so if you can figure out where that is uh, and then compete in, in that specific area, you're going to rank faster because you have more topical authority there, even if you don't have a lot of uh, overall global topical authority or sorry, overall authority. So I mentioned brand marketing, but um, brand marketing is actually one of the best ways to build authority uh, for, 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 for non-backlink type authority. So we've seen things like influencer marketing have huge upside, even if you're doing influencer marketing in an app, like you're doing a bunch of Snapchat ads or you're, you're, you know, you're sponsoring an influencer. Um, more users are going to go to Google and search for your brand. They're going to search, they're going to share your content. And that is all authority leading back into you. Uh, if you're buying a ton of ads, similar. So lots of people are going to go search for Grammarly on, on, on Google if they see a Grammarly ad. If Gordon Ramsay goes on The Tonight Show and talks about Masterclass, 
bunch of people are going to go to Google and type in Masterclass Gordon Ramsay. And now we have more branded search or they're going to share that or they're going to talk about that. So actually brand marketing, traditional brand marketing is a great way to build uh, authority for SEO for some of these things other than backlinks. And then last is on the on the conversion and, and uh, engagement side. So I mentioned that um, we're seeing some uh, counterintuitive things, uh, especially when looking at articles. So again, the the common wisdom of the past is that users don't read things online. They, they look at short little snippets and then they go on to the next thing. And what we're seeing when we're using uh, data like heat maps or screen recordings or surveys is that users are actually reading uh, a large portion of the articles. And there's many other things that are surprising uh, if you actually look at data. One other thing is that users typically will read a whole article and then stop right before related links and comments, and they won't look below there. And it's this dead end, and then they leave. And so this is a great opportunity to figure out how do we get them to the next article. Um, but if you don't have data to see that, then you don't really know. And so if you can gather, especially qualitative data uh, from users about how they're engaging with the content, then you can feed that back in and get a lot smarter and more precise about uh, increasing engagement for content. So again, to summarize, um, we've started with uh, what Kevin said, which is take stock of, of all the content assets that you have and the value that you have for users. Then we also look at where is it that we wanna go? What do we wanna rank for? Uh, and what is the right strategy for that? What's the right page type? Is it a content marketing uh, strategy? Is it an organic strategy? Is it both? Uh, which page types belong to each of these intents? And then how does the design content and engagement all fulfill that intent? And I'll send it over to, uh, to you, Mara. A second to share my screen. Oh, one second. Cool, awesome. So we've heard from Kevin on content marketing and how to use the content to get more users to come to your brand website. And then uh, we've heard from Ethan on how to optimize the SEO to get even more users to find you. Um, but as you know, um, actually apps do a really good job um, at actually converting and retaining your users much better than your website. So once you've acquired users through organic strategies to your website, how can you actually take them from your website inside your app? So one of the things that you can do is this idea of leveraging web to app conversions. Uh, so actually showing banners on different pages where you're actually getting users to content marketing or SEO. And, and use those banners to convert your web users into app users where they're more likely to actually convert and retain. So, you know, some interesting things you can do with these banners. Uh, you, I think the, the really key around these is the idea of personalizing them and not showing everyone the same banner. Google penalizes you, especially if coming from search. If you show someone one of those big banners like the StubHub one, or the AP News, or even the Rent the Runway here. So the only ones you should show if someone is coming from an organic search, it should be the one uh, that uh, the example of Under Armour. But if someone you know came to your website from an organic source and then browsed around and went to a different page, uh, or if someone's coming from social media and from email, you can actually show them much bigger, um, much bigger banners, etc. Um, so this is just an example of how you can use one of these banners. Um, you can show them an interstitial depending on where they come from. And then you, the, the one important thing here is to actually maintain the context. So if someone's coming from a specific page, actually take them to the exact same page to send your app. And you can use, if you use branch for your banners, um, the deep link behind the banner actually keeps the context. One really important thing here, uh, we did an analysis of people using these banners and we try to we try to understand, you know, are all banners created equally? And while there is some um, difference between the banners, we found that actually that difference doesn't actually matter that much. What matters is actually this idea that if you personalize and you show people different things, depending on where they come from, where they are, 
um, they are way more likely to click and convert. So uh, this, this shows, you know, like the, the 0 0.8 conversion rate is for people who just use one banner on all their pages. They don't do any personalization. The 2.1 is maybe people use two or three versions. Maybe they use a few interstitials and then have just a small banner on everything else. Uh, and then people who do a lot of personalization and actually like go and change um, the messaging depending on the page you're in, the, the button, the action button, uh, the language, depending on the country you're in, et cetera. Those people actually were able to take the conversion from view to click for their banners to 5.4% from 0.8%. So that's more than 5x uh, the conversion by actually personalizing uh, these banners to drive people into the app from your website. The other interesting thing I want to talk about specifically, you know, when it comes to organic, we've talked a lot about web, optimizing web. Uh, but I think there are two other places that are, I think sometimes are important to think about. And uh, I think QR codes is a really interesting organic strategy that is doing, uh, it, it's really made a comeback uh, during COVID. And this is, you know, this is something that we've had at Branch for a long time, but we only saw it used in Asia before COVID. With COVID, this became really big. So there's two ways to use these QR codes. One is actually this idea of using the QR codes from your desktop. So one thing that we saw, we looked at um, how the COVID has impacted um, different platforms. And we saw that um, desktop web has also seen a pretty big spike. Um, and you also can see that you know, desktop web has a lot more usage during the week with dips into the weekend. And then mobile web and app has also increased. So both desktop web and obviously all digital has increased, uh, but desktop does have higher usage or during the weekdays and lower usage over the weekend. So one thing that we've seen companies do is actually use QR codes to get on the desktop to get people to download the app and activate the app on their account. So this is an example of how TripActions does it. Uh, this is another example for build.com uh, where you can actually text yourself the app instead of using a QR code to convert someone from desktop into, into a mobile web. Um, um, and um, the, the Optus is another example here that create a custom desktop landing page with the text me the app feature, again, to convert people from desktop uh, into, um, into mobile web. Um, the other examples that we've seen of QR codes is people trying to convert uh, from the offline world into, uh, into the app. Uh, Pete's Coffee uh, is, a really, is a really interesting one. They added QR codes on all their um, coffee cups and this is how the coffee cup QR code looks. And then they've also added them um, on all their stores. And if you scan the QR code, you are taken to that store and you can order ahead and then just go and pick up versus going inside the store and talking to someone. Uh, so to just like minimize contact uh, and potential exposure. Uh, this is another one from a Singapore company, Sing Life, who using QR code in ads. And this way uh, they can obviously get conversion to a specific uh, promotion, but they can also track, the, track those ads and which specific uh, ads actually are doing better than others and which locations work best. Um, and then we've also seen a few, and this is an example from Thailand, but we've had quite a few in US as well, um, where people are showing QR codes during a TV commercial. So that way they can actually track, um, uh, get the app downloads, but also track what works and what doesn't through those QR codes. So uh, that's it. I saw some people raising hands. Um, and uh, if we have any questions, uh, please add them uh, in the Q&A or into the chat. Uh, we can still be here for another few minutes. Well, if there are no questions for today, 
Oh, that we have on here. We have a few. Okay. What do you suggest to manage growth for an investment app? Um, I think, you know, Ethan, you've had some experiences working with some investment apps. Do you have any, any suggestions on this one? Yeah, so I would say that um, whenever you're thinking about an app, it's useful to think about the LTV. And if the LTV is really high, then obviously you can do things like paid and referrals and incentivized referrals. So my initial thinking is that any investment app is going to have an extremely high LTV. And so therefore paid and incentivized referrals like, you know, get free $10 or your friend gets $10 or you get some free other thing. Um, those are probably going to be uh, very interesting to explore. The other thing, I would probably start there. And then over time, I would get more into uh, things like content marketing, because a lot of the investment content online is still not that great. I think there's a lot of room for opportunity. So I'd probably start with uh, paid channels and try to get break even uh, with your LTV and then start branching into organic uh, to amplify that after you have some traction. And I've seen, I think a lot of the newer banks um, use the both ACO. So if you're looking for like something like, you know, uh, both the SEO and referrals. Uh, so I, I know someone like Robin Hood worked a lot on their SEO strategy. So if you're looking for buying a specific stock, there's actually an article around that. Um, so there's SEO could work well. And then like uh, referrals have worked well in financials for um, investment companies like Robinhood, the referral. I think they used us in the early days for the referral and it's been one of their best channels, but also in a lot of the banks and, 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 and others have worked, uh, referrals have worked really well. Um, Let's take Oscar's question. Best way to understand keyword traffic and how to prioritize? Um, this is a really interesting one. Uh, I think you can use a lot of tools out there like SEMrush, Moz, to get keyword traffic. And I think figuring out what those keywords are, you know, what branch, we actually look at three different areas. One is the keywords that we rank on right now. We want to rank better. The other one is competitor keywords. And the third one is what we call the brainstorm keywords. So basically the keywords that we think we should rank on and then we think we get volume um, potential to like rank, like these companies actually have some really good numbers. And then we came up with our own um, scoring depending on relevance to the branch brand, uh, volume of traffic, uh, potential of us to actually like score uh, and get on the first page for those keywords. Um, and, and I can share in one of the future webinars, maybe in the paid one, I'll share like what, how we created that and how we decide which keywords to focus on when it comes to both paid, paid and organic. Um, based on your experience, what are the top three growth activities for a food app? Well, Ethan, you are the VP of growth for Yumly, so. Yes, I can help with that. So a few things, um, SEO for sure is one. Community is, is another. So the food community is really strong. There's tens of thousands of food bloggers and they're all very supportive of each other. And so building relationships with influencers and, and community members within, within the food community is, is great. There's also things like nutritionists and restaurants and all kinds of different um, subcultures within uh, food. So tapping into that community, I think is uh, really effective. The second is, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, content marketing. So producing really great uh, recipe content, producing really great articles. Uh, Masterclass has had good success uh, ranking for a lot of different food terms. So SEO is uh, huge for, it's probably one of the largest categories within SEO. The click-through rate is really high. Uh, so I would do that. And then last is social. So how do you have content on your site that then gets shared back to social? And I think that this is even more important than having your own owned social uh, channel. Like if I'm a food blogger, I, yes, I can make my own social channel, but getting my users to share my content with their friends uh, is a way to really amplify. So again, um, building a community sharing and then uh, SEO and content marketing. Great, thank you. Then we'll take another one from the chat. Do you have any data on when it's best to take prospects from web to app before or after a registration conversion event? Um, we don't have data on this because it's completely different depending on the app. Uh, I would say the best practice here, first of all, I think it's important to test both. 
uh, and see what your conversion rate is if you take them before or after and what your drop off is at every step. I would say one thing that's really important is that you don't like push them to the app too early. So, um, you know, I think sometimes people, when someone comes to a website and maybe they go on one page and then they see a big interstitial join the app. I think, you know, I like to think about the experience of interacting with the users like dating and in some ways like getting uh, them to up, 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 get the app is like closing the deal or getting someone to be in like a steady relationship with you. And if we ask them too early, they get freaked out and then they like, you know, they, they get annoyed. So in many cases, it's actually important once they've like shown some interest. So if they've looked like, let's say at 20 pages or uh, if they've just purchased something or if they've just, they're just about to purchase something. And then it's also very important that you give them an incentive. Taking them to the app uh, is more work than just getting them to register, right? They have to go and download and then you ask them to register. So it's important to show, give them little things. So maybe they do half of the registration uh, on the website and they fill button and then you take them to the website to finish it, but you give them something for it, right? So um, I remember we were working in the early days with um, a shopping company and they had this thing where if you came from SEO, they had a little banner that said, buy this in the app and you get 15% off. And they added a 50% coupon to the link behind that. So there was this incentive for people. And this was uh, a, a, an app, I think they ended up being bought by Walmart. So they were definitely focusing on low prices and they knew that that 50% actually meant a lot to their users. So uh, we they saw tripling their like organic app downloads just from by adding that 50% to the banner. So that made a huge difference. So understanding that like, you know, with them having the app is really important and like will build your relationship. But like if you ask too early and if you don't give them an incentive, you might also turn them off. Um, okay, how long does it take for SEO for UGC to work and rank? Uh, Pinterest type list, top 10 Joe Rogan episodes, etc. I think maybe Ethan or Kevin, do you guys have any thoughts on this? I actually don't know the answer on this one. Yeah, I'm happy to jump on this one, Ethan. If you're, uh, maybe you can add some to it. Perfect. Um, so generally, with any question how long it takes to rank, there is th the first reaction is always it depends, which SEOs love to say. But then to give you an actual answer, it will depend on a couple of different factors. The, big, the biggest factor that this depends on is how competitive the query or keyword actually is, right? So there's another relationship between the length of a keyword and the competitiveness. In many cases, the longer the keyword, meaning the more words it contains, the less competitive it is. The exceptions apply, right? But that's that's a relationship that we can clearly draw. So for, for uh, you know, to, to figure out how long it takes, you can use tools like Ahrefs, SEMrush, Moz, and, and a couple of others to understand the competitiveness. Um, and when that is something that's created by users, uh, meaning if those lists, for example, are user generated, um, then I wouldn't necessarily like worry too much. I would more engage users to just create content and then over time see what Google naturally tries to rank. And you can see something like that in the Google search console. And then you can see what um, how many impressions single queries get. And that, that will help you to then better understand how Google tries to rank your site, what to optimize for, what content quickly gains traction. But um, if I got your problem right and your, your context, and I wouldn't worry too much in the beginning how long something like that takes to rank, I would much more worry about factors like engagement with the content that users create content on an ongoing basis. Great, thank you. Uh, how would you go about calculating LTV? I can take this one, but if someone else wants to take it. All you. All me, okay. So I think, um, you know, if, as you think about, we'll talk about this actually in the last session on, on measurement uh, and retention. I think the, the best way to do at this is like figuring out, and this is, can be, this can be a lot easier for um, if you're a consumer company and people buy right away, you kind of figure out how many times on average do they buy, or if it's a subscription, what's their average like lifetime um, when 
for the subscription and then how much they pay on average. Um, and that can be a pretty simple calculation when it's actually uh, a B2B company where the cycle is a lot longer and maybe they stay with you for two or three years before they churn. I think you kind of have to figure out what your churn rate is, how much do you make per customer per average and how long do they actually basically stay with you on average and you just multiply those to get your lifetime value. Uh, but it can be co more complicated if you're a startup and you don't actually know how long people will stay with you. And you can usually in those cases, you kind of look at the, the data that you have, what's your current churn rate, um, and you guess <laughs> in the, if you're an early stage startup. If you're a big company, you probably have all those numbers and it shouldn't be that complicated to, count, to calculate. Do you have any tips for improving retention for a life improvement company like such as uh, such as Calm? And then also, how can we organically grow for a mental health app? So, do you guys have any thoughts on uh, mental health um, improving retention and, and growth in general? So, my main thing, my main recommendation is to try to build a habit, <clears throat> and I think meditation is a perfect example where or meditation, exercise, uh, eating well, where you have to establish a habit. And so I think the best way to increase retention is starting with the new user experience and activating the user to get to, to perform a specific action that they can then create a habit around and then getting them and having daily reminders to, to do that daily or weekly reminders. In the case of meditation, I think daily is perfect. So probably the best way is to say, what is a bite-sized amount of meditation that is realistic for a new user to do? Let's push them to do it once and then let's push them to do it a second time, build a habit out of that. And then that is, I think, probably one of the best ways to, to build retention. I know that Headspace has like a first 10 days. I think Calm has something similarly, but building habits, I think, is probably the, one of the most effective ways. Uh, this one is interesting. If you have a campaign in large city and you want to feature QR codes, do you have several different messages? How do you set up those unique QR codes? Uh, so actually, if you use branch, um, every branch link has a different QR code. And you can actually go and change. So you could create for every campaign, you can create a different link with a different QR code. And you can actually change those links. So let's say a QR code goes to one link for a while, and then you want to change where that link goes to after like two months, but you already printed the QR code. You can go and change that, and you can have like hundreds of them and like test and see how each of them is working. Um, so um, I, I would suggest giving that a try. Um, Okay, Ethan wants to answer. Do you have any 2020 tips for web pages? Go for it. Yeah, the main thing um, for, for 2020 tips, uh, I'm missing the question, but um, it's about highlighting the expertise of the author. So for your money or your life content, which is health, legal, and finance, the, the author needs to be credible. So if you can specify the author, specify their credentials, um, uh, Nerd Wallet, I know, will give you know stuff like they have a particular degree or certification or things like that. They've written for this particular publication, but talking about the fact that the author is is an uh, is an expert, so that could be at the top, the bottom, a separate author page. Um, those are one way, and then number two is to just have actual established influencers and celebrities in the space if, if you can do that and get them to write content. Cool. Well, with that, I know we're over time. Um, thank you so much, Kevin and Ethan, for joining us today. And thank you, everyone, for being such an engaged audience. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you at the next um, in installment of this on Thursday. So thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.